Hi, it's the 16th of July. I'm Sumipa Shetty from the Mumbai News Center and these are the top headlines. Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao says that China will increase measures to support growth in the world's second largest economy. Asian stocks are rising on the back of China's stimulus hopes. And back home, all eyes will be on the inflation figure for the month of June. It is seen at 7.6%. Core inflation is expected to continue its uh, downward trend and April data may get revised upwards to about 7.2%. Now, despite the gloomy current scenario, LIC's chairman DK Mehrotra expects to continue the FY12 trend and invest about 45,000 crore into the equity markets in FY13 as well. Now, that's a Bloomberg UTV exclusive. These, of course, are the top headlines at this hour. Time now for In Business with Harsha Subramanian. Well, thanks for joining us on our brand new show, In Business, where we feature people, ideas and companies that move markets. You're in business with me, Harsha Subramaniam, and this is on top of our agenda. Top-rated stock, Tata Steel, we talk to the dynamic CFO, Kaushik Chatterjee, on his strategy to cut costs. Most watched in global markets is China, Raman Tuli of PIMCO joins us in business from Singapore. We'll also be talking macros with the best in business, featuring Adi Godrej on the economy. But first, Surbi on the stocks that are hot this morning. Surbi. All right, so let me quickly run you through a quiet start to the week. The benchmark indices aren't doing too much and that's in step with what Asian markets have been doing in trade. There's not much of global talking point as yet in international markets. So you don't have that trigger to either move up or down. So our indices have been quite flat. Uh, if you see some of the other movers, sugar is very definitely a talking point in the market. Now, there's some talk that India might look at imposing a sugar import duty for the first time since 2009. So therefore, there's a little bit of buying. You can see some green across the board on a Renuka, on a Dhampur and a Balrampur Chini. Uh, the stock of the morning in terms of the earnings impact is DCB for the negative reasons. DCB is down. The net interest income growth was in line with expectations. Profits have soared. But their net NPA level is higher in the last quarter, the first quarter, compared to Q4. And it seems the market is choosing to look more on the negative than the positive this morning. Very interesting moves on the IT side of the market. Mine tree up 3.5%, yet another good quarter for the company. In fact, I'll be back with some details on exactly what's working right with this company and the stock in a moment. All right, on top rated stock, we put the spotlight on Tata Steel, the sixth largest steel company in the world. 65% of its revenues and production come from Europe. These are clearly challenging times for both the industry and for Tata Steel. Profits, for instance, for Tata Steel Europe were down 90% for the previous quarter. Take a look at its price action over a period of three months. Today, of course, it's trading down about 2.5% at 414. Well, that's the uh, that's Tata Steel for you. Uh, that's uh, the six months chart. Remember, this is a commodity business. It's a great business to be in, but the commodity cycle has been playing havoc over a period of time. And the key factor has been in, in, in China and how China's consumption story has affected global commodity prices, steel prices in particular, coking coal prices as well. That's Tata Steel for you, down about, uh, down about a year. All right, what's the strategy for Tata Steel? I sat down with their key man in charge, Kaushik Chatterjee, and I asked him if steel demand would bounce back this year. Well, I think Indian demand has been um, structurally quite attractive and, and, and on the upward trend. So uh, while it may, uh, may have diverted from normally what we used to call as 1.3 times the GDP growth mm. uh, because in recent times, in recent quarters, it's not happened. But even then, 7% uh, growth uh, of steel demand in India is not uh, something which is very high. Mm. It, and with some bit of policy efforts on infrastructure and other areas, it can certainly come closer to the two-digit number. Mm. So I, I don't think structurally Indian demand is in any risk of... Um, not growing um, upwards. The trajectory and the speed of growth may vary between say five and a half, six percent to maybe eight percent at the best case. What about domestic steel prices at this point in time? Um, we saw them cool off a bit in the month of June. Do you, how do you see them behaving? Um, you know, if I look at from our perspective, uh, the steel prices have actually held quite firmly. A, because the way we uh, sell steel uh, through the way in which the channels have been developed over many years and the and the the way in which we distribute steel that's one 
as also the OE sector with, with, with whom we have significant long-term relationships. So uh, I haven't seen uh, much softening or any softening to that extent in, in, in recent months. Um, also the fact that the, the given where the rupee is, the import parity has kept it fairly high. I want to talk about Europe for a wee bit. Um, a large chunk of your production happens there, a large chunk of your revenues come from there. Uh, there is a larger problem in the European economy. Uh, a, what is your view on how Europe is shaping up? And do you believe steel demand is going to be muted for a long time to come? The political direction is not yet clear. So we're moving from election to election uh, of certain countries to decide how does the fiscal union remain uh, in, in Europe? Uh, we got over uh, France and Greece recently. Uh, but structurally, the, the issue has not been addressed. Um, the banking system is uh, really fragile, I believe, and needs uh, perhaps a significant capitalization. Um, there are uh, asset qualities in these banks which will hinder them from uh, giving significant credit. The Basel uh, norms that are coming in will also have its own impact on capital requirements, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which all means that the availability of capital, which was the basis on which the expansion of Eurozone happened mm -hmm. in between 2003 to 2008, uh, has contracted severely. And if that contracts, the pace at which the economy grows will also be uh, reflected in the same manner. And that, I think, is an issue. What about for your own operations? We are therefore looking more internal um, to uh, revamp, restructure, and rework our organization and our, and our business, which has been launched last year, actually, through a process which we call as the OGSM process. And uh, to look at a asset configuration, to look at uh, supply chain issues, to invest in renewal of the critical assets, and ensure that we are flexible with the market and ensure that we are able to produce uh, based on the market demand and we supply to more customers to whom we think that we can supply with more value. We have been looking very significantly at our cost based, at our productivity levels, uh, at the levels at which we will want to invest in certain parts of the business and so on. Raw materials, coking gold prices have cooled off, uh, iron ore spot prices have more or less stabilized. Uh, how do you see prices of both behaving? China is a big determinant. Um, it consumes more than 50% of the global iron ore uh, produced and therefore it, it actually determines the cost curve. So if, uh, if China does not pull so significantly or we have newer uh, volumes coming into, um, into, into play, uh, I would imagine that the consensus forecast for raw material is only uh, more uh, downwards uh, than upwards uh, going forward. Coal may be a little different story uh, because the f physical availability of coal is not that much as iron ore and therefore it may held, uh, hold back to its uh, level of around $200. What about your own uh, production targets? Uh, you've stated publicly that you're going to be expanding your production here in domestically. Correct. Are you expanding in India? What What is the target that you're looking at? Yes, yeah, so what we have just now is we are uh, uh, Jamshedpur facilities will be at about 10 million tons uh, this year. Mm. On our, at the end of this uh, this fiscal year, we would be at a run rate of around um, of 10 million tons of crude steel uh, or thereabouts. And uh, uh, our next project is in Orissa, where we are looking at building up a 6 million ton greenfield project, mm. um, 3 million tons each. So in the next few years, we will have uh, that completed, uh, the first phase of three and then the three. So we should be at least 16 million tons in the next few years. How much money is, is being invested in, in all this expansion? As far as the next, say, four or five years, we will be spending about uh, between around $7 billion to $8 billion um, on greenfield projects. How much of what you're talking about will happen this year? And if you were to give me a split between the greenfield and brownfield. So um, our brownfield expansion is, is on, uh, you know, almost complete. There are few facilities that needs to be uh, commissioned. The Orissa one? Please. In Jamshedpur. Jamshedpur. Okay. Yeah, the Orissa one is completely greenfield. Mm -hmm. So every year we've given guidance that we'll be spending about $2 billion on all of the CapEx um, for the next few years. And you hold on to that? 
Yeah, we hold on to that. Yeah, because this, I mean, it's a zero-one situation. Mm -hmm. You have a green field, you've got yeah. to do it. Okay. Yeah. So you, the the slower you do it, the longer it will take. Yeah. So there is a efficiency in using capital faster and bring it to um, to production. Uh, other projects will depend on how the economy goes in the next few years. I want to talk about the uh, the currency. You know, the rupee has perhaps been the worst performing currency in Asia. It's weakened, what, 20%. It's marginally retraced. How much of it has it affected you? Has that negated all the benefit that a falling co coking coal price has, has given? Um, not really, but I think, you know, it, it impacts in two ways. The first one is on the revenue side, where uh, we do import coking coal. So that has pushed up the raw material prices effectively. And... Um, Secondly is the steel prices are, if it is, it, since it's a globally traded um, product, it's uh, traded in dollars. So, so long the parity price is higher, uh, the reference prices have been higher. So from a revenue side, it has been beneficial. From a cost side, it has been, uh, it has been hurting in terms of higher raw material costs. Net, net, I would still say it's neutral to a mar mar marginally positive. Two questions, one on currency, another on interest rates. By how much do you think interest rates are going to go down and how will it impact you? And do you think the Reserve Bank could have done more in managing this currency volatility? I am actually always been less worried about absolute levels of depreciation or appreciation. So long it remains somewhat range bound. It, the volatility is what you know makes the decision making very, very challenging because if it is very volatile, as you just said, you know, 20% within a few months, uh, it makes it decision making very critical as to you do something which you think is prudent today and tomorrow you proved completely wrong. So it's the volatility which, which is a reflection of flows, etc. As far as inter interest rate is concerned, there's not much headroom, I believe. You know, we are at a peak. There is a cut that is being sought after at this point of time. Perhaps will come, uh, but then how far will you um, keep managing it? Because you have the other side of inflation to manage. So mm. it's a balance, and I, I don't envy RBI's role. But I, th I think it is a question of how you balance it and add on through fiscal measures. Your own debt levels. You publicly said that you want to maintain a one is to one uh, debt equity. Um, is that on track? Have you been w working on reducing your debt on your books? Yeah, so we have been very active on, on basically managing our debt books. Um, one is to one remains a, uh, a stated objective. We have been in the last you know, financial year at about 1.1. Uh, for a company which is going to grow as fast as we talked about a little while earlier, putting in a few billion dollars of uh, asset, you know, if you're putting in some seven or eight billion dollars of assets in the next four or five years, mm. uh, we all obviously have to rely on uh, taking external debt. Uh, but once we do that, uh, it is going to be incremental and we keep managing our debt portfolio actively so that we prepay sometimes debt to many manage the levels at which we are. Uh, but our stated objectives of 1.1 one X times the debt equity remains uh, as it is. Talking business with Kaushik Chatterjee of Tata Steel. Uh, well, that's talking about 412 at the moment. Bloomberg data reveals that most brokerages have been bullish on the stock because of its strong fundamentals, of course. 56% are bullish on the stock. 20% have a hold call. 22% brokerages are bearish. Uh, Daiwa, in fact, has uh, the highest target at 559. Nomura is also bullish has a 550 target uh, on the stock. That's Nomira for you um, at 550. Motilal has a sell call on the stock with a target of 255. And uh, currently the stock is trading at about 412. Well, that's the story on Tara Steel uh, in business. We're all over the place online. Find us on Twitter at uh, Harsha in Business. Well, that's the handle. Talk to us, write to us. But coming up next, we'll also be talking to the best in business, Adi Godrej, on the economy, on inflation. Back in business in two minutes. It's Monday, 16th of July, and you're back in business with me, Harsha Subramaniam. 
The most watched number today is inflation at 7, 7.5%. It's a big concern for the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, even as corporate India wants interest rates to be cut. Possible? Adi Godrej, chairman of uh, Godrej Group and one of the most respected voices of corporate India now joins in. Mr. Godrej, many thanks for joining us. Inflation about 7.5%. Do you think the Reserve Bank has been unduly worried about inflation when growth is suffering? Is there a case for a cut in interest rates? I think there's a strong case for lowering interest rates. I'm not saying that they are unduly worried about inflation. Inflation is a problem, but the inflation has been caused by two things. One is the global commodity prices. And when the global commodity prices did come down and our inflation would have come down, the rupee depreciated. In both cases, the Reserve Bank has to see to it that the perception is positive, the perception about the Indian economy. And high interest rates are creating serious problems in terms of demand for uh, goods that are financed such as residential accommodation and uh, automobiles. It is also creating a problem in terms of investment into manufacturing. So I think it is about time we reverse the policies of high interest rates. The big macro worry has been the currency, Mr. Godrej. How much of it has affected corporate India's decision making? I think it's a very important factor. It is very negative for the perceptions on Indian economy. It's going to be negative for Indian companies. And I think it is very important for the Reserve Bank to see that uh, the fluctuations in the rupee uh, are kept under control and that the Reserve Bank's intervention in the rupee depreciation should be more vigorous to my mind. Do you, do you believe that the Reserve Bank of India and the government are still not on the same page in, in tackling inflation and reviving growth? Well, that you can't expect. The Reserve Bank is an independent entity. It should be independent. So I don't expect necessarily to be on the same page, on the same line. And uh, I, I value the Reserve Bank being independent. But, however, both should be much more conscious of growth policies than they have been. To my mind, that's extremely important because otherwise, even politically, the government will suffer a lot if growth is not restored at an early date. But what about growth, Mr. Godrej? Do you believe our economic prospects being strong enough to attract the foreign capital that is required? No, unless we reform immediately, unless we get the reform process going, which has slowed down, I think uh, growth will decelerate. Uh, the global situation is uh, not uh, very good, uh, but India has the opportunity. We have many ways to accelerate our growth, and if we have the will to do it, if we have the political gumption to do it, I think we can get back to a 9% growth rate during 2013-14. As the head of CII, what are those measures that you're recommending the government do? Well, I don't want to speculate on what the government will be able to do or not, but I can tell you what I think it ought to do. So first of all, it should open up foreign direct investment very considerably, especially in multi-brand retail, in the aviation sector for our aviation companies from across the world, in uh, the defense sector, in insurance to 49%. So many such uh, moves could attract a considerable amount of FDI. And as far as perception is concerned, we've got to see to it that the perception of India improves and we are able to attract more foreign institutional investment also. Adi Godrej, pleasure having you in business. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lots more on the show. We're all over the place online, as I said. Find us on Twitter at Harsha in Business. Up next, we'll also be talking to Raman Thuli of PIMCO on what's trending in China and what's going on. You're back in business with me, Harsha Subramaniam. The world is watching China. The dragon is slowing down. China has been slowing for six consecutive quarters and the growth rate at 7.6% is the slowest in three years. Where is China headed? Raman Tuluwi, Singapore-based global co-head of Emerging Markets at Pacific Investment Management Company, or PIMCO, which manages the world's largest bond fund, now joins us. Uh, Raman, pleasure having with you. 
you know, China has been, as you said, uh, growing extremely slowly. What's the sense that you're getting? Is, th is this going to stabilize? Is there worse to come? Um, or do you think the worst is over for the Chinese economy? Well, what we saw in, in the second quarter was really a continuation of the slowdown uh, that began last year. The Q1 GDP was also revised downward. What we're seeing is just basically China uh, adjusting to a different global environment. The drivers of Chinese growth in, uh, in the first part of this century were net exports, and then with the financial crisis, investment. And because China is, is working off some of that excess investment and still in the process of transitioning to stronger household demand, we're seeing this slowdown in uh, the Chinese economy. I mean, you know, Beijing has been tweaking interest rates that we've seen uh, to stimulate consumption. But if you look at the retail sales number, they're quite strong. Do you think there is a case for the rates and for the reserve ratio to be lowered even further? Yes, I mean, the, the, the fact that the Chinese government acted twice in, in the space of a month to reduce uh, lending costs is, is an indication that, that, uh, that they see uh, the need to provide some insurance against further downside in, in China's economy. Uh, so while some of the data, such as retail sales, is a relative bright spot, uh, the reality is that the Chinese economy uh, on the whole uh, is still in need of some incremental easing of financial conditions. And that's exactly what we've seen with the two interest rate cuts, with the earlier reduction in reserve requirements. And, and we think that sets the example of what we're like to see in the, likely to see in the coming months as well. Ramin, uh, Beijing has been fine-tuning fiscal policy. We hear Premier Wen Jiabao now talking about uh, e more economic support measures coming after a political meet. Uh, my question to you is, you know, in 2009, we saw a fairly aggressive fiscal stimulus coming in with about $4 trillion one being refueling the economy. Do you see that kind of money being pumped in? Well, that's an extremely important point. You know, in 2009, there was really an all-in policy response in China. Uh, they eased financial conditions, they expanded uh, credit, and had a very aggressive fiscal stimulus. The response to the slowdown this time around is very different uh, in China. Instead of a, uh, an all-in response, there's much more of an incremental response that's anchored around easing, uh, an incremental easing of financial conditions. We have not seen, and we don't anticipate, um, a mega stimulus um, on the fiscal side of the kind that we saw in 2008. And the reason for that is because such a stimulus has collateral consequences. It, it tends to prolong this dependence upon an investment-led model of growth. And because Chinese policymakers are aware uh, of the consequences of such a mega stimulus, they, their first choice is definitely to avoid one. Um, and, and as long as economic indicators are weakening incrementally, um, we don't think that a, a mega stimulus is in the cards. Ramin, Beijing has also been uh, put in place certain fairly strict property control rules. It cannot re restrict those rules uh, for, because it's been raining in speculation. Do you see those restrictions going away? But in an environment like this, is there a reason for them to stay? Well, again, the key is going to be this idea of incremental changes. So Premier Wen, uh, in comments that were quoted in the Chinese press today, acknowledged the fact that the economy was slowing down, that the economy required uh, additional accommodative policies, but also said that the uh, measures to restrain excesses in the property market uh, would, would continue to, uh, to be maintained. So what I think the right thing to do is to, to, to think of uh, Chinese policymakers as having a bias against uh, a, a big investment program, to have a bias against measures that would tend to inhibit uh, the adjustment in the property sector, but at the same time, they will be pragmatic to the, in, the uh, ongoing flow of, of economic data. Again, we can draw a contrast in, uh, uh, versus the situation in 2009 where there was a much stronger commitment of a unidirectional policy to stimulate.
Raman Tuli, many thanks for joining us with your perspective. Pleasure having you on the show. Well, that's a wrap on In Business. Thanks for watching.